Well, guys, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me and Coach Dick Gould today for, I didn't know what word to use. I just put interview, but this is going to be a lot more fun than just a, a bland old interview. And uh, what we're going to work today on is, um, you know, the slogan, or the, or the title up here is Navigating the Murky Waters of Your Mind When the Pressure is Intense. And, you know, uh, for, for probably 120% of you guys, Coach Dick Gould knows does does not need any 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 kind of introduction, but just so that, just so that we make a formality out of it here, Coach, um, I'm just going to kind of go through this and then, uh, and and then we'll get going. But uh, Stanford men's coach, 38 years at Stanford as a player, a coach, and then director of tennis for 57 years, uh, 17 NCAA team titles, 50 All American honors. Is that 50 players? Or is that 50 honors for a lesser number of players? Coach? <laughs> well, it's easier to be an All-American in tennis than it is in football, but uh, that's players. Okay. All right. Uh, the 1978 team, which, which I always think is just remarkable. It's one of those great trivia things, you know, well, who won the 1977 men's NCAA singles title? Well, everyone goes Matt Mitchell. And then you go, well, what number did Matt play when he returned in 1978? I think it was number four, right? There was there was McEnroe, Mays, and might have been Perry Wright playing one, two, and three. So that was that was quite a team. Um, coach of the decade in the '80s and '90s, nine different Hall of Fames, um, from, from what I could see. And you know, just like me and so many other Bay Area, and I'm sure around the country, if not around the world, a mentor to to dozens of teaching pros. Um, so, Coach, welcome to the show, and this is just spectacular for you. Uh, spending some time with us. Really, really appreciate it. Well, I'm excited, Brandon. Really nice to see you again. It's been a while. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it has I been a while. I think saw each other in person, I think, might have been at uh, your, your new abode. Yeah, it's um, Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We were up here. You were, you, were, you were the guest of honor a couple summers ago for uh, Jim Swigger, one of my all-time favorite people. He'd served, he'd served the people up here for 25 years. And, uh, you know, he and his wife, uh, Stacy had just done a, just done a great job. Uh, unfortunately, Jim passed away uh, about a year ago, yeah. and um, uh, but yeah, I think I think that was the last time that we saw you. And and even you mentioned saying that Brent, you guys look away way too relaxed up here. Looks like you found your <laughs> looks like you found your calling up here in the mountains. So, uh, Coach, I wanna I wanna ask you, you know, what I what I invited you when and, and what we sort of talked about was what we wanted is really if you've got a couple of stories or times when all of these, you know, coaching for 38 years at Stanford and having to work with one of your players in, in the heat of the moment, right there in the battle, where you had to kind of come up with some of your best coaching because your player was maybe mentally not where they should be in terms of, um, trying to get the W not only for themselves, but also for the team. So, you know, maybe there's a little backstory because we've talked a little bit before about how this is really a team thing. The whole mental approach to, to, to playing college sports is a, is a, is a team thing, but kind of give us that backstory. And then maybe if you've got one or two instances where you had to navigate one of your players through some rough patches mentally, um, we would love to hear this. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, questions are always welcome. And uh, I, I, I think the first thing I think we all have to realize, and, and we know if we've been in this business very long, is that you have to be yourself. And you can't be, uh, I can't be Denny Ralston if I'm not Denny Ralston. Uh, I can't be Brent, I'm not Brent Abel. I can't, you know, I have to be myself. And I think that's the first thing that I had to learn when I started to coach. Uh, started to coach. I, one of my jobs when I started teaching high school was coaching football. And I hadn't played football myself since junior high school, so it had been a while. And I tried to be a Vince Lombardi type coach, and that wasn't me. And, and I learned that in a hurry. It was a great lesson to learn for me. You have to be yourself. And, and then I think, of course, the other thing to know is that uh, when you're coaching, everyone you coach is a little bit different. And it's not a gender difference. It's not a uh, age difference. It's just what, what button do you push to get that person to respond to whatever, whatever it is you're teaching. It could be a complete beginner. It could be a great player. And uh, what works for one is not the same for all. 
And I think that brings up another element I think that's really important in coaching, Brent, and that is that of flexibility. And I think that is one of my strengths. And I was able to be flexible and to adjust. And uh, when the guys flipped me off because they didn't want to hear what I was saying, <laughs> I just rolled right off and hey, we went on the next subject and from there. But uh, I think a couple of things. I, I think the thing that uh, in a pressure situation, what I hated most was when a guy started worrying about winning or thinking about winning, getting out of the present into the future and what's going to happen if I win this match for myself. And also I'm teaching and coaching a team, the team, uh, I have to get them back in the moment some way. And the fascinating part about college coaching and to me, the greatest attraction of it is the fact that you can coach in college to the player at any point during the match, as long as you don't bother the opponent. And my guys, you come in for the first year to drive them crazy because I'm going up in a key point just before this or the second service and kick it to the back end and get it in tight to the forehand and do this after that. And, and they're looking at coach, I'm trying to play the damn point, get on my back. <laughs> and, and then they get used to it a little bit. And that's just, that's just me. And I wasn't going to change. And, and I first started out, I had no confidence doing that. I was afraid to do it. But as I got more confident in what I was coaching and I, I, I think my trademark was, of course, a very first strike oriented type style of play, being aggressive. And, and uh, as I got to see the results of that, I got more confidence in what I was saying and doing over the years. And so I wasn't shy at all. And uh, it was interesting. I, I, in the heat of the moment, you say, well, what do you do? Uh, I remember in 1970 up in Utah, Salt Lake City, we were playing the NCAAs. And my first, I'm just starting to have a pretty good team. Roscoe Tanner had just come into Stanford. And uh, he was playing up there. And Roscoe's a good doubles player, but not a great doubles player. Uh, and he was playing with a guy who I'd actually dismissed from the team because he tanked a match, his last match of the year against Cal. He was worried about Vietnam or something, and I was more worried about the match. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I wasn't going to let him back on the team. He came back in the fall, and he got in his hand and knees and pleaded and pleaded and pleaded. And I finally said, I was convinced he really wanted to be on the team, and that wasn't going to happen again. And he was. He ended up having the best win-loss record on the team that year and playing right. number six and uh, was playing doubles with Roscoe and was a great doubles player. And so they're in the semifinals and they're playing uh, Eric Van Dillon. I can't remember who Eric was playing with at the time. Mike Michelle, I can't remember who he was playing with, but it was a good team. And um, Robbie Ripner looks at me and says, Go, it's, it's five all in the third set. We got a chance to win this match. And that would be one of my first wins over any any individual win over a particular opponent of any sequence and uh I said, what do i do what do i do i don't I don't know where to return this ball i said robbie just give yourself plenty of margin hit it, hit it over the net <laughs> and he almost hit over the fence <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and we so they get a they get a break point and uh or a hold point to be serving to to break us for the match and he looks at me again, and I'm just laughing before they had, we, we got that point, got it back to our ad again, break point. Robbie's returning. He looks at me again. I was, I was, I was laughing like crazy. He said, I got so relaxed. I had a great return. We broke serve and held and won the match. And so that was kind of funny. And speaking of Roscoe, another time uh, we were playing, he's playing Jimmy Connors at Stanford. And Roscoe was the guy that really turned our program around. He had a great attitude. People loved to watch him play. It was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, the first player of, of great stature we had. He attracted a lot of other players at Stanford. A lot of attract, attracted a lot of fans into tennis itself. And um, we're playing. He's playing Jimmy Connors, and he's pretty much down in a match. I think as a story someone was telling in a book I'm writing, I had my my guys all tell stories. And Alan Margo says, yeah, he says, I was talking to Roscoe after the match. He says, what, what did coach tell you that changed that match around? He says, well, it was 6-3, 3-0 for Connors. And he walked into court and he looks at me and just waits a second. He says, Roscoe, what did you have for lunch today? <laughs> and Roscoe, Roscoe said he looked back and he didn't know what to do, but he said he relaxed him so darn much he went on and won the match. So... I guess, I guess, you know, different things at different times. It can't be always serious. Sometimes you tell a joke, you ask a guy, what do you do, stay all night with your girlfriend last night or, or what happened? But uh, everyone's a little bit different. And so it, I think that was kind of fun trying to figure out what buttons to push. Sometimes you're taking it, you never, you never know for sure. And those buttons change depending on what the guy had for breakfast that day, whether he passed a final or didn't pass the final, whether his girlfriend broke up with him or not. Uh, 
I, I remember one time I was talking to Alex O'Brien and, and Cal, and he was losing to Ove Ben Peterson, his name was. Right. And uh, really a good player. And it was 6 3 3 0 for Ove. And uh, I walked by, I said, Damn it, OB. How high is the net? He says, three feet. I say something like, well, just hit the fucking ball over the net. <laughs> and he went out, he went on and he said he lost the match, but he got the five all in the third set. He felt pretty good about that because he came back from disaster. Well, you know, it, it's interesting as you're saying this, that, I mean, the first couple of guys, really what you helped them do with Rob Rittner and then, um, I guess, yeah, I, I guess it was Roscoe, is that, is that you really helped them relax by just not, you know, not thinking, well, I got to coach him a certain way. I got to figure out, well, what's the right tactic or what's the right technique. I'm, I'm curious in when, when you started coaching at, at Stanford in what, 1966 is, I mean, if you'd had those guys in 66, would the message maybe have been a little bit more serious? Meaning that you, did you kind of go through a period in the beginning of your coaching thing where everything was kind of serious and well, I got to help these guys as opposed to, what sounds like these guys already know what to do. All I have to do is help them relax. Well, it was a lot more than that, but uh, no, that's a, that's a good point. It did transcend a little bit there. And, and that was a key point. Rob, Rob Rippner, I inherited. He was admitted to Stanford the same year I was accepted. So we came into Stanford together along with you know, Johnny mm -hmm. Spiegelwell and a fellow named Ronnie Collins, well, sure. who's still playing senior events. And, uh, and and so they were my three inherited freshmen, and, and they were the guys that really it was during the Vietnam War. Paul Mary and Paul came in the next year, and and it was a, a lot of things going on in these kids' mind. Yeah, and tennis certainly wasn't one of them. And uh, uh, I was, I just said, well, I think we can win a championship, Stanford. People laughed at me. They said, There's no way you can beat SC and UCLA. They're in another stratosphere. And I played at Stanford. I knew damn well where SC and UCLA were. I didn't want to be reminded of that. Right. But I really felt that Northern California had a lot to have offer. The environment in tennis in Northern California at that time was booming. Tennis boom was just getting started. A lot of people were interested in tennis. And it just was a great time. And uh, Rob, I remember I sat them down at a team meeting. He said, well, guys, we're going to win the national championship at some point here. And Rob, they said, we just looked at each other and uh, thought, you're crazy. We're, who's, who is this guy? What's he talking about? And... Uh, I guess that brings up a couple of things. Number one, my goal as a teacher has to be aligned with the goal of the kid. Now I can raise that kid's goal a little bit to a point, but if the guy's laughing at my goal, we have, we have no basis of, of commonality and it makes it a little bit different, difficult. So as an example, uh, I, was, I was up here talking about something. My guys were coming out in the sun to get a little relaxation, not worry about Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, get some rays, enjoy the sunshine, get a little exercise in and go back and study. And I made everything they do so important for so long that I, I think I really hurt them. Uh, every mm -hmm. shot they hit was important, every practice was important. They were in a match, guys, we gotta win this match so that we, if we do this, we can do this, we're in position to this. And these guys got so tight they couldn't hit a ball. Mm -hmm. And then finally, in spite of myself, uh, we did win, we kind of snuck up and won a championship in 73. and. And I think at that point, I became a much, much better coach because I could focus a lot more on the process of improving rather than on the end result. And I think right. that's my transition was made. I kind of thought, well, we won it once. I, I've died and gone to heaven. I can't go anywhere else. I'll take it right now. And if it happens again, fine. But that's not my goal anymore. I, proved we, I got my ego out of the way. I, I proved to myself, really, that we can do this thing. And uh, once that happened, I think I really became a, a, a much better coach and took a lot of pressure off the guys. That's cool. That's cool. Um, Dean Schlobaum had already graduated. Is that right? When you, when uh, you Dean, started no, coaching? Dean was there. He was there. But, uh, he came in. He was in my first recruit, recruit class, Billy Atkins. Dean okay. Schlobaum. Okay. A couple of good um, Californians. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Um, so look, 50 All-Americans. Obviously, you brought in some talent. And it, what, what, what I would be curious to know out of the 50, um, well, I've got two questions. I've got two questions. Number one, out of the 50 All-Americans, was there any one of them out of the 50 who was not, let's say, a marquee name, who came in there and maybe for a year or two or three or however long it took to be with your process, 
for them all of a sudden to be now all of a sudden the guys playing so well from from you know from when they first came to Stanford. Um, you take guys like you know McEnroe Mays and all those guys. I mean, the chances of them becoming all an all American were were pretty darn good. But how about some of the other players of those fifty who well, you who you for, thought for one, before you go on the next one, Brent, because it is relevant. I think that brings up a really, really good point as a coach. Uh, I made the mistake on several occasions, both with individuals and with, and with uh, teams, of underestimating what the team could do, uh, of not expecting enough of them, really, in many ways. And I think that's really important because they'll always surprise you. Uh, in tennis, we had we started out, we had eight scholarships. There was no limit. It was great. Then Title IX came along. The women ended up with eight. And we end up with five and then all of a sudden four and a half. So a lot of my guys were on no scholarship. Alex, Alex O'Brien had no scholarship when he came to Stanford. Um, I'll take another, let me name two, two guys who I underestimated, or one I underestimated for certain. A fellow named Jimmy Gerfine out of Great Neck, New York. He was a good junior player, maybe top 10, but he was a backcourter and a scrapper and uh uh, fighter and and he came in he was number 10 to start his freshman year and I thought you know I I, I kind of stopped recruiting him because I had other guys I really felt could help me more and he came anyway and of course he had no scholarship and I thought well he's number 10 that's pretty good but he kept working hard and working hard and by the end of that year he ended up I played him for the first time in the starting lineup at the NCAA championship but there's all kinds of pressure on him wow and that year we were playing Cal in the finals. I remember Billy Wright, what an amazing person, wonderful friend, and we miss him greatly. But he was a coach uh, at Cal at the time. And here was his one chance to win the national championships. And they're in the finals with Dunk, and Marty Davis, Chris Dunk, uh, Phil Lenhoff, uh, uh, Mike go on and on, Randy Nixon. Um, Doug, Doug King was gone by then? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Randy Nixon, who else? Another great player. They were, they were loaded. And rightfully in the NCAA finals, and we were playing, and Jimmy Gerfine's in the matches, and he'd done a pretty good job in three matches before this to get to the finals. And we had lost, uh, we were getting kicked. Uh, it was indoors, started rain, so we moved indoors. And Cal was beating us in almost every match. Singles went first. Billy has been a great friend since we were 16 years old. We met at the National Public Parks Tournament in Arcadia. He's from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I'm sitting there on the court, having figured we'd lost the match, that we were being given up on my team. And I'm trying to decide, well, what am I going to do for Billy? Am I, I lost my focus on the match. Am I going to get him a case of beer or a couple of bottles of champagne? What am I going to do for my friend when he wins this thing? Well, all of a sudden, we started turning those first set losses around. And Jimmy ended up winning a key match to even a score uh, or put us ahead. I forget which. Even a score finally at three all in singles, and then uh, did a great job. And and here is a guy who I thought was always going to be a second six player in the starting line for the first time, and under the greatest of pressure, doing great. Uh, the hard part of that was to do that. I had to take a fellow out of the lineup who was an outstanding player and always played well, named Jeff Jeff Aaron's. And Jeff had done a great job for me all year. And I just had something in my gut said, Jimmy's ready to go. I'm going to put him in. And that's pretty ballsy for a guy. Hadn't played yeah. here. And he came through beautifully. And then all of a sudden, a year or two later, he reaches the, not only qualifies for Ains and Blades, but he reached the finals. Here's the guy with one of the first big Prince rackets, uh, baseliner, totally. He wins it. He gets to the NCAA finals, serving and volleying, uh, plays Tim Mayotte in the finals and loses in three close sets to Tim in the finals. And here's a guy I thought was always going to be a second six player. I totally underestimated him. I gave up my team during the final match, the biggest match of the year. They came back and proved me wrong. So, but, what, did coach, so, so what did Coach Wright do for you? <laughs> I'm lucky to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, you know, but, that, but those are important lessons. And, and then another, I mean, there are other guys like that too. In 1980, uh, you got to a point where pro tennis is coming in and guys are turning pro. And so if you did pretty well one year, you might lose two or three guys to the pros. And that's not decided until the NCAAs usually. So then you come June, you play the NCAAs and, or late May. And by the time they say they're going to turn pro, you've lost recruiting year. You, you have to apply before 
uh, before January 1st. Right. If you haven't applied, you can't stamp it, won't let you in late. So uh, you're out of luck. So we would win, the, well, twice we won the NCAAs, didn't even get invited the next year. That was when we only had 16 teams and then came back and won it the next year. Mm. In this particular year, we came in and I had a bunch of guys leave. I forget who they were, but we still had a great player in Scotty Davis, who ended up being 11 in the world, two in doubles. And a uh, really solid senior player. You probably know from Berkeley Tennis Club, Mark McKean. Sure. Really, really yeah. a great, great guy, our captain. And five freshmen. So five freshmen in my top seven, I'm saying to everybody, well, how are you going to do it? They're saying, how are you going to do this year? We lost a lot of guys last year. I said, well, it's obviously a rebuilding year. We'll be solid, but uh, we'll be a year or two away. Well, these damn guys went through and won the NCAA. Ace. So I totally underestimated this team. Awesome. So as a coach, guys, just uh, remember, just don't, Give them credit. Don't don't uh, don't sell your guys short individually or a team collectively. It can really surprise you. Uh, give them, empower them, uh, help them to believe, encourage them, be positive with what they're doing. Who would you say uh, mentally tough? I mean, that's kind of a big buzz term th- thrown around pretty pretty loosely. But um, thirty eight years coaching men's tennis at Stanford. Who would you say was the guy who was just mentally well, just, was, just 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 iron just just yeah. just rock solid? Yeah, great question. I I I think it, I'd have to go with John McEnroe. I I just uh, for a guy coming through under pressure, I I have never seen what he could do. Uh, we were playing down at UCLA, and it's a full house, thousand people, uh, crowds going crazy. We had a great rival with UCLA. That was in 1978, actually. Uh, one of my better teams and one of maybe one of my best teams and UCLA was very good too. They had a couple of great guys, a couple of top tenors in their lineup and Max playing Elliot Telcher. And we were behind three matches two doubles were played second and UCLA had great doubles. And if we lose Max match, he's the last match in the court. Uh, we're going to be down four, two going to double and on, on a way away from home. There's no chance we're going to win that match. And so it gets to be, see, Max down 6 2, 5 3, and it's a no ad scoring and a deuce point. And Telcher serve, he's serving from the backcourt, serving for the match. Now, match point to go up 4 3 in the team match and to win the match with Mac. And Telcher works his way in the net. Mac runs all the way across the court, match point against him, against the team. Really a tough crowd. And it's a backhand cross-court winner to break serve, held, came back. Telcher just kind of wilted in. And Elliot was really a good top 10 player to be and, and was very good then. And Mac had always had trouble with him. And Mac pulled that match out. We came back and won the doubles. But that was the greatest shot under pressure I probably – that I remember. Wow. And then we go on into the A's and Mac's got to play uh, – he's got to play in those days we had – the individual tournament. Uh, he started off with two singles the first day, then two singles, one doubles the second day, two singles, one doubles third day, one singles, two doubles the next day. And then he had, uh, uh, he and Billy Mays were playing doubles in the semis and uh, something happened at court. They're both dead tired and they got in a little bit of an altercation as doubles partner, not an altercation, but some, someone should have poached and they didn't or some, someone said the wrong thing. and ended up losing to a good UCLA team. So uh, Mac wasn't in the doubles finals, but he played in the singles finals the next day. Now Mac had gone through the individual tournament um, pretty well and had lost a couple of sets in the team tournament. He, this is 18th match in eight days. It's 90 degrees plus and 90, over 90% humidity. Uh, he's playing uh, John, a guy named John Sadry in the finals. John didn't play in a team event. The team, North Carolina State, did not qualify. But he was a big server, strong fellow, big guy. And he served bullets, believe me. I think he served an average in 28 games. I think he served 28 aces or something like that, an ace a game. And Max exhausted. Uh, he had a really light warm-up that, that morning with Peter Rennert, his best friend. Um, he was tight. His back was tightening up on changeovers, you have to lie down the back. The trainer would come on a court and stretch him out. Uh, the first set, Mac loses serve first. 
at uh, Sadri had not lost a set in the tournament. Mac had lost uh, in the individual tournament, which followed the team tournament. It was fresher. Not lost a set, not been close to losing a set. And he breaks serve against Mac, goes up like 5-2 or something like that. Finally, Mac breaks back. And he'd been down, had been down double, triple bright point several times again and managed to hold on. Uh, finally, Mac broke him back and then broke him again, or went on and won a tie break 7-6 to win the first set. Second set, pretty much the same way. Uh, this time, there are no service breaks. It was 7-6 for Mac. Third set, uh, tilt, uh, uh, Audrey. So Audrey breaks serve for, and wins a match set, the set 7-5. And in the fourth set, again, 18th match in eight days, amazing heat, couldn't even move, it was stifling, no breeze, no nothing, madhouse crowd. Mac really wants to win this tournament. All the odds against him, his back's really getting tight. Uh, I'm the best manager I ever saw with ice towels and, <laughs> and uh, reminding him to drink. That's my big match contribution. His match is winning a championship. Take some more liquid, Mac. <laughs> Here's an ice towel. <laughs> and uh, Mac came through and uh, won the third, the uh, fourth set, seven six, seven six, seven six, five seven, seven six. One Amazing. of the greatest performances I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I think there was a lot of pressure on him. Um, I mean, I'm assuming, I assume, I'm assuming he came into Stanford as sort of this big, the big deal. Here's here's John McEnroe coming into Stanford and probably expecting i mean was that sort of the 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 expectation that not only would he be playing one um but he would he was probably penciled in to win the to win the ncaa well he'd be one of the favorites elliot telcher certainly would be there there were there he wasn't the only guy there he lost it during the season at Eddie edwards his last home match of the year he lost to uh uh brian Gottfried back back at uh trinity uh, mm -hmm. In fairness, Mac had 140 re temperature in that match, but still wanted to play no matter what happened. Uh, but Godfrey had always given him trouble. Uh, he had close matches with Teltry. He wasn't, he was the favorite, yes, but he wasn't the lead, lead pipe since favorite either. Right, um, right. The, uh, it was a tough draw. He did a great job with it, and he had to beat Billy Mays in the semifinals of singles to get to the finals. Billy wasn't any slouch. No. Um, it, was, it was a tough one. Yeah. You know, I, I've, I remember seeing some college matches back then, but I don't remember, and maybe it was still going on, but what I've seen recently is all of the screaming and yelling and, and, you know, all the rah-rah stuff between teammates. You've got, you've got one guy who's playing a match and two courts down, someone else is playing a match and you're kind of almost, it's almost like you're, your 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 focus is obviously on your match, but you're also watching out for the other guys too, right? Someone next court hits a great shot, and you're saying, "All right, well, great, great shot." Was that going on back then? Because I would think that would have been a major distraction mentally in terms of what you guys were doing. Always, always competing for titles, always playing the toughest teams. Um, Hold that, that thought. I want to come back to that, Brent. That's a really important point. Important point. Uh, I want to go back to that team with Mac for a minute because, you know, he didn't walk in automatically being number one because we had great players in that team. Uh, two Northern Californians were one and two in some order, Billy Mays and a uh, great player. And Matt Mitchell, another great player. Um, and so I, I came in, first of all, I told Mac when he played, he played some for an old Bill Reardon, Reardon, Reardon circuit uh, during school in the spring quarter of senior year, spring semester mm -hmm. senior year, he played five or six pro tournaments, Ash, Passerelle, Smith would play, and did pretty well, held his own, enough so that he was able to get into the qualifying at Wimbledon. Uh, and then he went straight to Wimbledon and, and was in the representing the United States in the junior event the second week, but he did so well and qualified for the main event that he couldn't play the junior event. He just kept on winning. And so he had a lot of matches in spring. And, and then after Wimbledon, getting the semifinals, he just kept on playing tournaments. I don't think he took a week off all summer. You can't, when you're chasing the points and things are going well, you don't want to let it go. And I don't think he took a, a week off all summer. So here's a guy coming to Stanford who's exhausted. And I told him when I picked him up at the airport, I said, Mac, I don't want to have you come near the tennis court all fall. I want you to get settled in school. I want you to go to class and I want you to 
to be here and become a Stanford student, take part in the activities and so on. So basically he was forbidden to be on the court during the fall. Mm -hmm. So I also knew <laughs> that he wasn't by reputation the greatest practice player of all time. You didn't, he didn't go out and practice repetitions with Mac. That's not his style. And he had his own style, a style I didn't totally understand. And so I avoided that and him getting stale and getting ticked at what I was having the other guys do by not having him out there. And he came out in the, in the January, and then I had to make a decision. I put it off as long as I possibly could. The team indoor tournament in Madison, Wisconsin is in February, in the middle of February. And I had to have my lineup set for that match. And I didn't know what I was going to do because Matt Mitchell had won the championship before. Billy Mays was as good as Matt on a given day, at least. And they'd always been rivals a year apart in Northern California juniors. One had won the championship next year. One had won the age group the next year and so on. And then a really great Southern California player, Billy Wright, was on that team. So I said, guys, I, I got it. I don't know how to I'm going to have you play each other. And that's one way to set a lineup. It's kind of the chicken way out. You say, okay, play each other. But mm -hmm. if you have three guys playing each other, it's always going to be one and one, one and one, one and one. There's never going to be two and so all, gotta, one and one, oh and two. It's right. going to happen. Right. Well, it didn't. Mac beat both players, but in three tough, tough sets. Mm. And, and in fact, the, after, it rained the day of the last day of the match. I cut it so close. We had no, I had to go indoors and play up in somewhere in the North Peninsula because of the rain, because I had to get the match done to turn in the lineup. And Mac, I was with Mac driving home, and I thought, Mac, he was so wound up, I was going to die. He was going into the off. He was so so tight after that match, going off the core road on the right. He was almost in the center divider on the left. It was raining. You couldn't see. It was dark. I thought I was gone. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then and then uh, Matt beat Mil excuse me, Billy beat Matt for the number two position. And then I had to give Perry Wright a chance. We played Matt Mitchell for number four, and Matt was kind of halfway into the match. And Perry's a great fan. And Perry earned the win, but Matt would beat him nine times out of ten, and basically halfway tanked the match. The match starts the season defending champion number four, a really good player at number five. Uh, a guy named Johnny Rast out of St. Louis. And then at number playing for number six, I had Lloyd Bourne, who became a top 100 player later on from L.A. Uh, Jimmy Hodges, who was a great college player, started almost all of his time there. And Peter Renner, uh, Jimmy is from uh, Maryland, and then uh, from New York, Peter Renner. And Peter ended up being top 40 in the world and was in the NCAA finals and uh, player of the year in college tennis a couple of years later. And they were battling for number six. And that was that they all had, they had a history of each other in the juniors too. So that was a tough, tough team to manage. And we finally won the championship. I had a ton, I, I couldn't jump up and yell, yell and scream. I'm sitting on the bench, towel on my head's down. I'm saying, thank you, God, for not letting us self-destruct because right. I didn't have the best team all the way down the line, I felt. And uh, I was so thankful the guys held together. And actually, ironically, the team was close. They were competitive with each other and very yeah. much so. But, they were closer and closer to this day. Mac was the best team, one of the best player, team players I've ever had. That's and, cool. Uh, care, really cared about everyone else and helped everyone on the team at some point or another. Uh, anyway, that was an interesting story and in how to handle how I handled that particular team. I, I had another question about. Well, I was just curious why, you know, in this day and age, all yeah. the screaming going on at the matches. and. Well, I think, you know, you have to be yourself. And, and tennis can be an emotional game, and sometimes maybe a team needs that. That was never my style, and I never really encouraged that. And uh, uh, I think other teams respected that, frankly. Other coaches respected that. I think we were kind of the model of winning quietly and losing quietly without excuses. And I, I really have to give my players a lot of credit because I think people really looked up to the culture we'd established in that respect. I can't say it's wrong. It, it brings some excitement to college tennis. The crowd, excuse me, the crowd gets into it a little more. It can help fire your players up if they're a little slow moving. But I'd rather say get your feet moving or something like that than I right. would yell longer. You know. Well, I just I would just think that I would think for some personalities it would be a real distraction in terms of trying to keep your focus on the uh, match at playing, hand right here. Yeah, but if you're playing in Georgia with 5,000 people all rooting for Georgia and at, uh, right on top of your neck and you and start barking like the Georgia Bulldog, whoop, 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 for a guy in court one, you're playing in court three, you know, oh my God, what's happening now? What's going on? I right. mean, the crowd right. can be as bad as that. And, and people just come up in Naples and play indoors 
against us. And we'd have five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people there, over 7,000 several times. And, and that crowd wasn't quiet, believe me, it was 99% Stanford. So, you know, we didn't incite, incite the crowd to make more noise, but uh, it was there. It, it, it's the environment. I mean, you notice it, especially if you're playing and there's no one in the stands, but if you're in the stands and filled and there, there are people rooting for both teams, it can be just as loud. So, you know, you don't, my job is to get my guys to focus on what they're doing. Not sure. about it. Yeah. But Dennis was, uh, Ralston was talking, I think it was last week about a Davis cup match. He played somewhere down somewhere in South America where it was, it was insanity. He said in terms of, they're getting coins thrown at them and they're getting water poured on them and this kind of stuff and, or liquid poured on them. And, um, and I just said, you know, do you think that made you actually a better player, you know, during, you know, having, having to sort of go through all that stress of uh, playing in a really hostile environment like that. And maybe what you're saying too, is that you would go to these, to these visiting environments and, and the crowds, and these are all mostly young kids in there, right? These are all college kids, and they're well, going in those nuts. Days early on. You could drink there too, so all had their cases so, with them and okay, sitting well, the hand, so. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good time. Um, listen, guys, if you've got any questions or any comments you want to make, now would be the time uh, to type them into the uh, chat area, um, Coach. If you got a little bit more time, I just want to go through a couple of these, if that's okay. Yeah, let's go. We go right down. Um, whatever you want to do. We've got Rob Thomas here from Mercer Island. Says missing you and Ann on the courts in the Stanford. Hey, Rob, how are you? Summer. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, they miss you guys. Nice hearing from you, Rob. I hope all is well up there. Uh, Alan Green is saying more schools are recruiting internationally. What is the appropriate ratio between USA and international players on the team? Well, you know, I, I never gave a scholarship to a foreign player. Uh, we had a couple of foreign players on their own who came to Stanford, but I never gave a scholarship to one. And that wasn't by choice so much as it was that I always, I was fortunate because once we got established, I was able to get the best Americans who get into school. And I think admission wise, you know, tennis players, most of them aren't real dumb. I mean, most of them have some smarts and I'm fortunate to be in a sport like that. Um, and uh, I figure that usually one out of the top five Americans in the, of the high school seniors each year would be a realistic candidate for admission. It would ensure admission, but to be a realistic candidate to get in. And if I encourage them to apply, and they did apply, and I could get them, I, I would be a leg up. And then usually one out of the second five would be eligible for admission, probably have a chance to get in. I'd look at the transcript, look at test scores and decide whether to push their admissions with the uh, admissions office or not. And if they were in the ballpark, I'd do that. And sometimes three out of the top 10. But my job was to get those guys. I think uh, the one guy, once we got established, that I lost was actually to Dennis. Dennis had just become the coach at, at uh, SMU, a great coach down there. Right. And I lost right. college tennis when he left. But, but uh, he had a guy named Johnny Ross, who was a straight-A student, and John, he was Johnny's coach. And I really wanted John at Stanford, and I did lose him. I think he was probably the only guy in about a 30-year period who was offered a full scholarship to Stanford who turned it down to go somewhere else. Thanks, Dennis. Right. <laughs> well, Bill Mays tells the story of uh, when you were recruiting him, and he thought he'd get a little smart aleck. He kind of he said, well, he said, Coach, do you think uh, – you know, if I go to Stanford, that I'll, I'll have it made in life. You know, you think, uh, whatever it was. And I think he actually, he told the story to his Hall of Fame induction at, at, at NorCal back in 2014. But he says that your answer was just, was to, was, was to Bill, no, I really don't think so. I really don't think so. And, and, and Bill's always said that he really appreciated the fact that you didn't try to oversell him and, and that you just made it real and honest. So, He's always, he's always appreciated. Well, I was a beneficiary of having Bill on the team before. Oh, my God. Believe me. One of the all times. Great, great coach in his own right. Great guys. And, and uh, you're right. A, a great coach. At you know, you talk about the foreigners and, and uh, uh, I, I, you know, it's easy to say, well, I didn't recruit them, so I didn't want them. But I coached junior college for four years and I had a guy named Horst Ritter from Germany who kind of fell into my lap, uh, who ended up reaching the quarterfinals of the NCAAs for USC. I ended up with a guy named uh, Raul Contreras, Poncho Contreras, his brother from Mexico. Uh, so I certainly wasn't against having foreigners on my team. Uh, just that if I had the Americans there, I knew their parents, I knew the family, and it was easier. To, it, I just took the Americans. Yeah. But but 
is it wrong to have foreigners in a team? Should there be a quota? You know, we're in America. You know, your relatives, you came from different, your relatives came from different countries, right? They had the opportunity to come here. Uh, mine did as well. I mean, that's, that's what our country is about. Uh, to try to put a limit on it is wrong, I think. Uh, in some ways, it'd be nice if they, <laughs> well, put it this way. If we're doing our jobs as coaches of American junior tennis, then the foreigners wouldn't be able to take our players' jobs on these teams. So we got to do a better job coaching. Yeah. And I would go a little further and say, as pro tennis has evolved and more and more, the top players often are not going to college anymore, as opposed to Dennis's years when they had, we'd be drafted if they did not. As more and more of the top players are not going to college, having foreigners in there gives the college team much more depth. Instead of having three or four good players, you now have six good players. And right. someone like Jimmy Griffin or players like that can go from number six, Peter Renner, from number six to winning in displays or being in the finals or something like that. So that's the benefit of having them here. And if we're complaining about it, let's do a better job keep teaching your own kids. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I, 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 it's great. So what about, there's a kind of a funny question here about, about Mac um, as a student. And, uh, you know, was he good? At, I mean, he was just there for one year, right? So was he a good student? And if so, did he focus in, in one kind of area? <laughs> I, you know, in the fall, I don't know what he did in the fall. <laughs> I know his roommate was a big, big guy. He was a hammer thrower in the track team. So he did, I know he didn't misbehave very much. <laughs> uh, you know, John, John did go to class. And, and uh, I'm not sure. It's pretty general freshman year, you know, unless you're in engineering or pre-med, which he was not, that you take in humanities, take pretty much a standard load of courses, which he did. I never asked him to take less units or more units. I didn't advise him in that regard at all. They have academic advisors to do that. And uh, he was always a, a satisfactory student. He never had any trouble with grades. He's a smart fellow, a uh, smart guy. As people forget, not only did Patrick go there, his youngest brother, but right. also his middle brother, Mark McEnroe, went to Stanford. He was on the team one year as well. Uh, let's see. Um, David from... Uh, Steamboat Springs, by the way, right here, yeah. is asking uh, what to do when doubles teammates get crosswise. And I'm not sure what that means. David, I'm going to have you kind of get a little more in depth. I could mean where there's just not much communication or maybe they're a little ticked off at each other. Um, I'm going to go first here with Major Dan. David, why don't you get back with kind of updating that, that question. Uh, Coach, what do you think of the new D1 rules? All three doubles matches count as only one point total. No warm-ups between doubles and singles and playing the let serves. That's a yeah. Okay. That's Let me start with the first, right first of all, I, I'm yeah. a traditionalist, and I really, really fought the uh, – I fought putting doubles, reducing the length of doubles. I really liked it two out of three sets. I liked it to clinch the match. But what was happening in, in reality with matches were going on and the match would be determined by – uh, say five o'clock in the afternoon and one doubles match was going on just starting a third set and they could be playing for another hour on that court and the team busy team had to go play over at Cal the next day. It was hard. And what really turned it around were the national indoor championships because you have to play with 16 teams and 12 courts, you have to play four matches in a row. And so they started by the, the eight o'clock match in the morning. As soon as the match was decided, they made you stop. So they could get the second match on, the third mm -hmm. match on. Even then, you went to one or two in the morning those, in those days. Wow! And so that's when they started. That's when they started uh, not finishing the doubles. And then the NCAA championship, the first couple of rounds became that way, and they had to really stop the match when it was done. Of course, if you lost the match, then it was the end of the season anyway, so it wasn't so hard. But then gradually, people started stopping the doubles in dual matches in general. If we played, say, we played. Uh, UCLA, and they had someone really, really hurt. He'd play a singles match, and, and then they wouldn't want to play doubles if the match were decided because they had to save him for Cal the next day. Um, that kind of started it all. Uh, and so doubles wasn't getting played, or as being, and, or if we won the match 5 0, we'd put a bunch of the second six in, and it was almost garbage time. Right. And right. so, in actuality, what happened by putting doubles first? It saved doubles. You had to play doubles. Uh, if you played two out of three sets, 
the first, say, one and two doubles were finished. Uh, they split, and they were like 6-3, six, 6-3. Three, six, three. Number two doubles to decide the doubles point. Let's just say they split sets. And they had to go in a whole another hour while everyone else was getting cold and couldn't play because a couple of those players who were playing on the court and that doubles were also playing singles. So they had to do sure. something that made them all end about the same time. Uh, I think, frankly, that uh, that playing – they ought to play at least to eight, not to five or six. Uh, I like no ad scoring. Uh, I really like no ad scoring. I think they ought to play till eight. I think it's a little too short the way it is. Uh, and I think I like, I always wanted some time to get my team together for a few minutes, even if on the court to have them regroup, uh, just talk to them about their singles opponents. I don't want to talk to them about in doubles before doubles about their singles right. opponents. I don't have time now to do that. So, uh, I always would take a little time to do that. So I never played when it went right into the, right into the, uh, right into the doubles, but uh, that would have been hard for me to adjust to. I think that everyone's doing that because uh, tennis takes long to play. You know, if you go, you go to Wimbledon U.S. Open, do you go at 10 o'clock in the morning or noontime in Wimbledon and you leave after two or three hours because you're tired of tennis? No, you're there because you're a tennis fan. Right. And I used to love these matches that lasted four and five hours where the momentum changes, go up and down, you're ahead, you're behind. I'd lead nine lives in those matches. What can I do to change the match? What's going to do this match? This guy's match. What can I do to influence the outcome of this match? And it was really fun for me as a coach and as a player. And uh, so I think that you, in trying to make it short, shorter, you still have some ebbs and flows, but it's not quite as exciting. And I don't know that we're getting any more people out to watch tennis just because we cut maybe an hour of time off the length of the match. What about let serves in college? Uh, women use women play them. Team tennis plays them. Uh, I, you have a let serve and a ground stroke. Uh, why shouldn't you play let serve right. in tennis? Okay. All right. Um, Mike is asking about uh, pro level coaching. Do you think coaching during matches should be allowed at the pro level? Well, and I think what he's saying is no, more than just the women where you get to what you get. Three yeah, no, that's, not, that's not coaching. That's just saying, how are you, uh, you know, right. slow down a little bit. That's not, I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking to coach, I'm, I'm talking about each point. Uh, yeah. Right. I'm talking to the guy about uh, he's getting tight, or he's starting to lose focus. I get his focus back by saying serve in tight to the forehand or uh, uh, volley to the open court or volley behind him in this ball or put your stand in the return or stand a little more to the left and return. Uh, you know, I, I get him focused on what he's doing right then and there. I get, him, get his mind back. Um, I, I think uh, being able to talk between points is incredible. And I don't think that that's ever going to happen during a pro. Uh, even I can't talk between first, second serve, where serve, depending on the first serve, what to do with the second serve. I, I'm, I'm not shy about that at all. And I'm wrong. I mean, in baseball, a manager or someone's calling what the pitch should be. Uh, whether, or whether the batter should look or, or swing away. Uh, I, I'm not shy. I'm going to be wrong a lot of the time, but I'm also going to be right a lot of the time. And, I'll, you know, I think uh, my guys were really good about doing what I wanted. Finally, they realized that it would, it would help them. And uh, uh, I think the problem is with the pro tour, especially the lower levels, you just can't afford a coach. You can barely stay on the pro tour yourself. And, sure. and so I think to make it fair, you really would have to, disallow coaching until you get to a certain level at worst, maybe top 100. Uh, I, I, I just don't know. Remember, I'm, I'm dealing with the kids 18 to 22 years old, and I was a, my whole philosophy is based on being proactive rather than reactive. I wanted them to force the point, to make something happen. There was less chance. I felt that they would get tight if they were focused on taking it to their opponent. Uh, sure, they were naked at net. They might get passed, but they might hit a ball in the net from the backcourt too. And so most of these guys, I think I had two pure serve volleyers come to Stanford. One was Sandy Mayer and one was Jimmy Grab out of Tucson. And other than that, uh, even McEnroe preferred to play in the backcourt. And if I weren't forcing him up the net, he wouldn't have come to the net all the time. Mm. And including on return of serves. And, and so I had, if my guys weren't taught the skill of skills in net play, the volleys and good overhead, anticipation, moving forward to the wall, a transition volley if they hadn't worked in those in juniors and I had to teach them that that was a skill that most of them had to be taught or, or refined much more and then they had to have the confidence to do it in the match but when you're working with something with your pro and as a junior 
and then you go into the next tournament and it gets to be a big point in the match, what are you going to do? Try what you've been doing in your pro for the first time in a match? No, you're going to revert back to what you have been doing. Sure. But as a coach, I can tell my player what to do. And so then if it doesn't work, it's my mistake, my fault, not his. It takes the pressure off him. And if he doesn't do it, he's not going to play. So it was a win-win situation, and, and they found out that it worked, and, it, and more times than not, and they got a lot of comments in it. And then as it worked more and more, we won more championships. They figured, well, it must work. This happened. This happened. So it was a much easier buy-in. Yeah, yeah. But when you have a skill like that, that's really something, and it says, this is what you've been taught, and you aren't physically able to do it until a certain age, really, then it's hard to do, and that's where coaching can really, really help. There's a comment from Phil Landauer, who um, I'm sure this this comment echoes or could be echoed through so many, so many players um, that have played against Stanford. And he's, he says, Phil Landauer here in Naples, Florida, met you in 1973 at the Princeton NCAA. Uh, real honor to hear you today. I was playing for the University of Arkansas. Your team was with Sandy Mayer. Rick Fisher, wasn't it? Was it, it wasn't Chip, was it Rick? Rick, uh-huh. It was Rick. Uh, Pat. What? And Pat Dupre, and, and he says, your teams were always great and classy. Um, you led them well. well congrats. Well, that's, so that, that means a ton to me, Phil. I'll tell you, we, we uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing a book, and, and uh, it's kind of on leadership and management, but it's a little different, Brett, because it's not how me saying how I, it's not uh, me saying how I managed. I have 200 players because in the early days we had uh, JV teams, a little bigger teams. And uh, I have 200 players who are still alive who played for me. And I sent them a list of 20 questions. Uh, how do we deal with ego? How important is resilience? Uh, how did you feel a part of the team? Did you feel relevant? Um, how do you think we sustained what we were able to do for so long, for 35, 34 years? I went at least one ring as an example. Uh, and questions like this. And I got these answers from 162 guys. And to answer these 20 questions took uh, a good two hours. If you did it right, sometimes four hours, I'm sure guys spent on it. And I had 162 responses. And then I took these, these <laughs> questions and I put them into book form, uh, into chapters. And uh, I've sent it off now to a reader to spruce it up and put it like a, a real author would put it. But it's really fascinating the things that come out of this. And one of the questions was, Phil, did we have a culture? And it came out time and time and time again throughout this book from the 60s on. Uh, class, uh, respect, uh, over and over and over again. And I'm more proud of that than anything these guys say in the book. I think it was a message they hit home. Um, and I think it really is an important part of the game. I think we all have a responsibility as coaches that we just don't tolerate anything but that. Uh, respecting your opponent and respecting the game. And respecting those who would let us play the game. I mean, we forget to say thank you. We get everything as a player. We get our rackets. We get our shoes. We get our lessons. You know, we get college. We get everything. Uh, how many? How many of you young players you coach? You tell do you're getting rackets from Wilson? Send Wilson a note once a year, twice a year. Hey, thanks so much for helping me. I really appreciate that. To or provide you with shoes. I mean, these things. Saying thank you and acknowledging what you have is really, really important. Well, that's great. Well, listen, Phil, thank you for that comment. Um, I know that means a lot to coach. It surely does. Uh, let's, let's take one more here. Boy, this is, <laughs> we're getting up on an hour here. This is great. Um, I want to take the last one here from Mike Ignatius. And he says, uh, Coach, you. Hey, Mike, how are you? You and my late father, Joe Ignatius, were hard to develop junior yeah. players for the combination of indoor matches and creation of the LA uh, TPA. Since junior involvement has flagged, do you think something like that would help today? It is such a great sport with few, if any, head injuries and should be booming. By the way, I was a ball boy for the great exhibitions at Foothill and love those memories and knowing you. Hey, Mike. We're, we're, uh, type in where you are, Mike. I don't know where you're living. And uh, it's just really nice to hear from you. Your father was one of my great friends. And uh, Joy Nations was an outstanding player, by the way. And uh, he's just uh, a really great friend. And Together, uh, one of the uh, person, Fred Costales, we started the Los Alamos Tennis Patrons Association. And that helped junior tennis in area at a time in the uh, early 60s when tennis was just, just starting to take off and really helped it a ton. And, and we, 
then I moved to Foothill College and we kept it going and enlarged it a little bit. So it became the Mid Peninsula Tennis Patron Association to, to promote junior tennis. And so we thought, well, let's, let's try an indoor match or two. And Dennis will get a kick out of this. Uh, our first match indoors was Ralston and Osuna. And then Jane, we had a couple of gals playing ahead of time who were students at Stanford, Janie Albert and Julie Heldman. And we played it on our wood inside our gym. See 3,000 people, and we really worked hard uh, to get a Eugene, Oregon, great. And uh, really worked hard to get a crowd out, and we packed the gym, 3,000 people. So then we did it again the next year, and we had Laver, and uh, we had Gonzalez and Segura. And then we did it again the next year, and we had uh, Ralston, Osuna, Edlison, and McKinley. Chuck McKinley's one in the world then. And they came out. Well, actually, it cost us more to get the amateurs to play than it did the pros to play. Uh, then he would go for 300 bucks. The coach at uh, USC would broker the amount. <laughs> and uh, soon it was two or 300. Edison, I think, was 200. And, and we'd pay him cash on the spot, amateurism. But that's, that's how the world was like in those days. Right. And then, then we have the pros. And oh, McKinley was 500 bucks. And I had to fly him out the night before. He said, well, my wife wants to come. Okay, I'll buy her a ticket, fly her out, but then she didn't show up. So the ticket was pocketed and I don't know where that money went. But <laughs> I must tell you, the pros, Gonzalez at 300, Segura at 200 were cheaper than the amateurs <laughs> to <Wow>. get. <laughs> so I'm sure, I don't know, Mike, but know your dad ever shared that with you, but it was really fun. But those, the history of those, uh, as our match at Stanford started to get more popular and Roscoe Tanner came into town and we started packing our old outdoor stadium with a thousand people. We decided, well, let's try it indoors. So Nick Saviano, a team member, and myself flew down to LA and picked up a used carpet out of a warehouse that was used for a big indoor tournament down there for a couple of years, a make, the May Company tournament. And we shipped it up to Stanford, courtesy of one of our do, uh, donors, Boosters, and laid it out in the first year on Friday night against UCLA. We had at USC had 5,500 people, including 1,500 out there in the afternoon. We had some more temporary seating. The next day in UCLA had over 7,000 indoors and over uh, 1,500 outside. So we had 15,000 people for two days. And indoor tennis really uh, was really fun those days. We did it for a total of 13 years, had indoor matches, including mixed matches. World team tennis match against Golden Gators, against Cal, against SC, a women's match against SC. We really loved it. It was fun. I, want to, uh, I told you at the beginning, before we started, I wanted to read something, a text I got from Jeff Jacklitz today. And... Um, uh, yeah, Jeff and I are business partners in a project called Gold Ball Hunting. We've had a lot of fun with that. And, uh, but I know that you know Jeff well, and, and he's always talked so highly of you anyway. So um, he, was, he was bummed out that he couldn't, well, he, he had to play a doubles match today over at um, somewhere over at Rio and in Modesto. But anyway, he said, he said, and this really goes, I think, to not only what Phil Landauer just said about college tennis, your influence on, on college tennis, but also the influence I know that you've had in Northern California um, and, and not just college, but just, just the whole tennis industry. And so Jeff writes, uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up with a tennis court in the backyard. In the mid seventies, Dick ran a fundraiser for the Stanford team called the Champagne Ships hey, on private courts throughout Palo Alto, Los Altos, Menlo Park and Atherton. He would send a player from the men's or ladies team to be the court host with a cooler full of champagne and beverages, and they would run a round robin doubles event on each court. Yearly event we always look forward to having. Also, he said the indoor matches at Maples uh, are legendary against SC and UCLA. He, uh, Jeff says it's a junior watching Sandy Mayer, Gene Mayer, the Mitchell brothers, Jim Delaney, Pat Dupree, Rick Fisher, Billy Martin, Brian Teacher, Steve Whitlinger, Steve Mott, was like watching gods play tennis. The atmosphere was off the charts. Dick always made time for me, even in passing in the Stanford match, asking how my mom and dad were. So, Jeff, uh, uh, Mike, you may sure remember this because your dad was, in, uh, we were working with a tennis page at the time, and uh, that's where the champagne, and champagne chips came from. And you appreciate this, Jeff, because at first we couldn't even find 10 courts, private courts to play this on when we started in the uh, uh, mid 60s. And by the time my last year that I ran that, where Chris Bradley took it over, we used uh, 44 courts, private courts. We had uh, 1,200 players. <laughs> and you get served champagne or d'oeuvres when you played. And Stanford players were in charge of a court, a team. 
They were the court captains, and sometimes they get the leftover champagne back, but more often than not, I never saw it again. <laughs> but there's some, some fun times. Hey, Steffi, I have a lot of quotes from my book. When that book comes out, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, there are a lot of FU coaches in there in the book and uh, in context of what they're talking about, and I think you'll love it. It'll be fun. There, It's not a G-rated book. <laughs> This is from Stephanie Savitas, who is uh, prolific on social media. Love, I love reading your stuff. Um, well, listen, Coach, thank you uh, so much. This has really been a lot of fun. Um, guys, if you've got any more pictures, uh, why don't you just send them over to me? I'll get them over to Coach uh, Brent at webtennis.com. Of course, you can also find Dick Gould at, at, on Facebook, um, and I'm sure that you could send him a message over there as well. But uh, – Guys, if you, if you loved this with Coach Gould, just go ahead and type in um, how much you did. And, um, uh, Dick, thank you so much, man. Well, guys, my, my pleasure. And I think, guys, we're really lucky to be in a great profession. You know, we're not dealing with people when they're sick as a doctor is, and especially nowadays we're not dealing with them when they have a problem like an attorney often is. You know, we're dealing with them most people want to be out there. So let's take advantage of that and be sure we keep our game fun for our teams. For individuals, that's the whole point, and be sure they leave there enjoying what they're doing. Um, good luck to all of you. It's been fun being with you, and uh, uh, I don't know when this book's going to be out, but hopefully about six months or a year. I think you really enjoy it, guys. It's written by my guys, frankly, and they don't, they don't hold back in telling stories. So, Steffi, it's going to be a blast. Take sure. care, guys. Mike, nice to hear from you, all of you, and uh, look forward to uh, meeting you, seeing you again along the way. Thanks, Brent. Dick, thank you. Guys, Thanks again for hanging out with us today. Get out there, help someone else have a spectacular day, and uh, we will do this again real soon. Um, thanks, Dick. Have a great day. Thanks a lot, Brett. That was good. It was fun for me. <laughs>